There is the implicit assumption that everybody knows what multiple sclerosis is. Is, is that true? Who has relatives with or has friends with multiple sclerosis? Hands up. Okay. okay. Not everybody, huh? Uh, does everybody know what neurofilaments are? Or has heard from that? Apart from Henrik. Uh, uh. <laughs> who knows about neurofilaments? And who admits that he does not know? Hands up. Okay. Neurofilaments are cytoskeleton proteins, and if you damage an axon, they go into the surrounding fluid, and that is what we measure, just the elevated speech about neurofilaments. Uh, correlation, sub-differentiation, and discrepancies, that is my subtitle, and that is the journey we had in, in the past few years with neurofilaments. These are my disclosures. <coughs> I want to walk you through how it started in 1988 with uh, neurofilaments and what I believe is the 2020 challenge uh, of further development to bring that biomarker into clinical individual application for patients. Not only multiple sclerosis, but because multiple sclerosis is, is a hot top, top uh, a hot spot in neurology because it's one of the treatments where we have truly efficacious therapy, which is not the case in many, many other uh, diseases. So let's start with the, the first uh, communication about neurofilaments uh, in 1998, showing that uh, the closer you are to a bout or a relapse or an exacerbation of uh, disease, uh, the more neurofilament you measure in CSF. That it was a pretty theoretical biomarker because uh, you cannot repetitively measure uh, with lumbar puncture in CSF outside of clinical stories. So it's a somewhat abstract finding. Uh, in recent years, there was accumulating evidence. Neurofilaments are, of course, not specific to multiple sclerosis. And you see here a chart of how levels are different across the different diseases. And in the red circle, you see that uh, multiple sclerosis is actually at the lower end. So it's, it's difficult to measure it already in CSF vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the normal values that are on the, the top left uh, of that chart. Whereas, for example, in certain diseases of neurodegenerative nature, they are extremely high. And the difference is explained by the speed of neurodegeneration you experience. So the more you burn your neurons, the more ne uh, neurofilament is coming into the CSF and later also into serum. Uh, Kevin has uh, shown that picture already, and the, the revolu revolution comes in multiple sclerosis with the transition from measurement in CSF into, into serum. That makes it truly a biomarker, because biomarker means repetitive measurement. So measurement, evaluation, interpretation, intervention, and then control. And that, that is only possible by measuring in, in serum. And uh, my colleague Jens Kuhle, who uh, will speak later, uh, was pioneering here this transition. And you see uh, on top of his portrait what is the difference between the ELISAs, the conventional ELISAs, and the digital ELISA from SIMOA, namely establishing a correlation between CSF and, and serum that allows us to believe what we, what we measure in serum is de facto reflective what is happening in the CNS. So that's, uh, the, uh, that's the uh, uh, conceptual advantage. The analytical technical advantage is that Simon brought a more than 100 times uh, increase of sensitivity and then allowed to measure uh, quantitatively uh, neurofilaments. So I want you to walk you through what was the hot topic in, in the past few years and where we have uh, reached now uh, credibility of neurofilament to be a, a measure of disease activity, drug response, and prediction in, in uh, multiple sclerosis. The bottom chart shows you um, how a patient has flare-ups with the red dots that are MRIs that are positive in multiple sclerosis, so you see lesion formation, and no wonder that neurofilaments are increased. That is not what we want. 
that is just duplication or confirmation. What is an attractive thing, and I, I, I take the time to walk you to and pinpoint, is this here. A patient who complains uh, about symptoms, I do not feel well, uh, I do not feel okay. There's something happening with me here. And the MRI is negative, but you can measure how neurofilaments are increasing. So you have an objective measure of inflammation going on. And uh, in continuation of that work from colleagues in Dresden, Germany, is also the notion that neurofilaments steadily increase prior the occurrence of a clinical symptom. So they, they are predict, they predict acutely what is going on with regard to uh, disease activity. Treatment response is currently the focus of interest in multiple sclerosis. Kevin mentioned 16 drugs being available uh, for patients of various efficacy, various uh, uh, safety profile, etc. And so to measure success is important, given that a treatment in the US costs $60,000 a year on average. And you see here data from a phase three study. The drug is not important. What, what is important is the difference in that you see that treatment with that drug leads to a decrease, a dramatic decrease in the next three to six months of neurofilament levels. So you can measure the efficacy of the drug by a blood test longitudinally. The placebo group in blue remains the same. And on top of that comes then uh, when you compare with an active compound, interferon here used as a comparator is a la rather weak compound uh, on clinical experience. And that is actually reflected by the difference of decrease of neurofilaments in, in the measurement uh, of that one-year trial. So uh, thingolimod being more efficacious than interferon. So the analysis of NFL matches the clinical experience. And what is somewhat the, the most important thing is to predict what is the future of a patient, uh, and we are not good at that. So we have knowledge on the group level, and can say, yeah, that this, is a, this patient has a lot of relapses, has a lot of lesions in brain, has probably a bad prognosis. But we are not sure on the individual level, and to predict that is, is somewhat the, the, the holy grail in MSology. Uh, this is a study we did with UCSF. Um, it's a 10-year follow-up study. On the left panel, you see how treatment with highly efficacious uh, drugs and low efficacious drugs in red and blue decreases the, le uh, uh, the level of neurofilaments while non-treated patients have a steady increase. That is one part. The other part is what you see on the right, namely that on the x-axis, the, the level of, of neurofilaments and in different years of, of uh, measurement of brain atrophy. Brain atrophy is the substrate of neurodegeneration, which is then leading to disability. Mostly, most important from my point of view, cognition is, is hampered. You know? Ambulation is, is maybe in the focus of a lot of people uh, seeing patients in wheelchair, but the challenge is, is actually cognitive impairment because that is not obvious, it's not so visible. And you see how a baseline assessment um, of neurofilaments before treatment then predicts how over the years brain at atrophy will turn out. That is an amazing result. It ne neglects something. And I cannot show you the, the data yet because that is a, a manuscript in, in uh, preparation. The long-term study looks into the neurofilaments longitudinally, not as a single measurement. And it is obvious that an area under the curve is more predictive than just a single measurement. Why? Why is that? In MS, you have undulations of neurofilaments, and by a longitudinal measurement, you get a more reliable uh, readout that averages out the fluctuations. That's an analytical reason. And the second reason is it is the first time the factor of therapy is also anticipated into the equation. And therapy, as you have seen, is efficacious to lower neurofilament levels. It 
takes years to transition into clinical efficacy. A fourth point is now the application of uh, neurofilaments in clinical trials. And for the sake of uh, time, I jump over that. But you can see the publication uh, uh, from Maria Pia Sormani um, recently released. And what it says is if you measure at the end of a six-month treatment, which is typical for phase two, you can easily predict who will have 18 months later disease progression or more impairment of clinical function. And that is actually achievable with uh, a $50 test and is equally efficacious than doing the MRI, which you see on the left. T2 lesions means scars in the MRI that you count or you measure the size of, being equally uh, well an endpoint and currently a reference endpoint, but NFL is delivering the same result. The transition is also into other uh, disease areas, and I show here the publication Kevin alluded to from a German group, how an increase of neurofilament precedes the clinical manifestation of dementia years before. So here, this is a diagnostic tool you can apply. You see also how it correlates on the bottom left with um, uh, the degree of brain atrophy or the degree of cognitive impairment. An amazing result. In yellow are the patients who are preclinical and uh, in brown those having uh, manifestation of dementia already clinically. And that expands now into other diseases like here uh, in, in Parkinson's disease, neurofilament differentiating between uh, the, um, the, the degree of progression of disease. The challenges in 2020 uh, are um, going beyond a single marker. So contextualizing neurofilament with flanking biomarkers uh, that add to the interpretation. Uh, GFAP is one of those, so an astrocyte uh, marker. Uh, and I show you here uh, results that demonstrate you can barely differentiate between neuromyelitis optica, that's a, an MS-like disease, and, and multiple sclerosis, is huge overlap. The only differentiation is that some of the patients with NMOSD have very high levels, but that's a quantitative difference. And it may be that by adding additional markers, so building an array of markers, will allow to differentiate and uh, results of our group and um, by others here, a German group, show you that uh, GFAP correlates better with disability than NFL, which does not invalidate the value of NFL, but gives, gives you more context and gives positive redundance of information that we may use in the future with a, a small array of biomarkers. The other challenge is, and I show you here, uh, uh, trauma on, on brain is that we do not understand why the half-life time is so long. So if you have a trauma uh, in, in the brain being uh, head concussions, et cetera, it lasts more than 200 days until a patient reaches, again, normal values. And we do not understand that. Uh, and it is likely, you see here the, the time, uh, time frame of uh, 200, 300 days, the um, interpretation is likely that inflammation is continuing, but we do not know that and we have that uh, in mind. We want to understand what NFL means with, uh, with regard to disease progression by looking into the lesions that behind a normal blood-brain barrier, smoldering inflammation is taking place here. And you see that NFL is increased in those patients who have uh, smoldering inflammation called rim lesions or slowly expanding lesions. Jens Kuhle will go into that uh, chart of application in the near future. Kevin has already showed you that picture. Uh, we believe strongly in the hit early hit heart paradigm of MS therapy, not the least based on the uh, 
reliability of neurofilm measurement we can apply to individual patients. And uh, one of the key features is to establish this normative database that gives us the references uh, of normality versus abnormality uh, in an individual patient. So with that, I want to end. Uh, you see here uh, on the biomarker sky, neurofilament is for me the brightest star. Thank you very much for your attention.